today's episode has been filmed and recorded. So, if you are listening to this episode, kindly refer to the description for the YouTube link. And if you are watching today's episode on YouTube, kindly refer to the description for the podcast link for Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Every little bit helps. Today, I will be your host and the guest of Finding Borders. I'm going to be talking about my experience of becoming an Australian citizen. My journey I've taken over these past five years, my moving to Australia, my applying for the necessary visas, my waiting for these visas to be approved then, and finally for the citizenship ceremony itself. The goal of today's episode is to be a voice for those who have gone through the same thing as me and my family, for those who are unfamiliar with the process, all the behind the scenes procedures. Today's episode will be a voice for that person or those individuals who are moving to other countries and who are perhaps waiting on becoming citizens themselves and everything that goes with that that I will be explaining in today's episode. So then, without any further ado, my name is Llewellyn Fisser and you are listening to Finding Course. Roll intro, season two, episode nine. mentioned there are four stages of my move to Australia that I would like to discuss today. So first of all there was the moving and second there will be the applying, third there will be the waiting and fourth the actual citizenship. So with the moving if we backtrack a little bit to 2015 when my dad got a job offer in Australia It was mid-2015, I got a phone call from him, and at first, I was in disbelief. I didn't really think he was being serious, because it's a whole nother world, you know, we've never been overseas before, any of us, and now he's miraculously gotten this job in Australia, a couple years after the divorce. So, yeah, he goes for the interview, and long story short, he had the job. He had to start in January 2016, and... The only people who were on board was uh, my brother. So it was him and my brother who were going to go to Australia. And me and my younger sister wanted to stay with our mother in South Africa. So they moved and that was that. And then fast forward to August 2016. Me and my mother, we had a massive argument. It had been coming on for months. She actually ended up breaking my my phone I had an LG G2 Android at the time it was the best thing since sliced bread for me still have it too because you know hopefully I can get some of the files off it one day it just won't turn on that's the only problem so we have our fight and that's what set things in motion to probably one of the best things that ever happened to me and when you have to go overseas to live in another country there are a few things that need to be put in place such as medicals so my 457 visa, which was a work class visa, a subclass 457, I needed to be put on my dad's. He can have up to four people, which was himself and us three kids, should we ever change our minds, which at the time it seems to be happening for me. So we, uh, we ended up doing a lot of medicals for me, which was quite confronting. I had to go and have chest examinations done I was under 18, so I maybe that had an effect on certain tests and medical practices that I just didn't need to go into. So I didn't have to do any blood work, but it was definitely confronting to know that maybe something was wrong in my chest, maybe I had some tumor growing that I never knew about. But no, the, the green light shun and um, 
fast forward December, my dad and my brother came and got me. And it was the longest month of my life because I knew it was going to happen. I knew I was going to come to Australia and um, I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know anything about Australia. I only knew the things you hear about on TV. Sydney Opera House, Crocodile Dundee, nothing that I actually experienced in Australia I already knew about. So next thing you know, we're on the plane and I, I wasn't in the best of moods. I was actually crying on takeoff because I was scared of flying and it was it was scary. I was, I was only a child. So we took off and we landed in Melbourne and yeah, we drove from Melbourne to Albury, which is where I've lived ever since. And that's, that's history. Um, I ended up going to school in Wodonga, which is in Victoria, because the uh, immigrants or anyone who was not a permanent resident had to pay at the time something like four and a half thousand dollars per year on top of school fees in New South Wales. Whereas in Victoria, where Wodonga is, and where my school was, they didn't have that law. So we would just 15 minutes cross the waters, I went to school. And that was another confronting experience for me. My first day of school in Australia, I, I wasn't sure what to expect again. Um, I didn't know how to speak to people because I wasn't sure if I would have to use my accent that I always use or should I try and sound more like them. It was, it was very strange for me at first. Um, I remember waiting at the bus stop and I, I was complimenting kids on their shoes and stuff, just trying to not stand there with my hands in my pocket and look awkward. But yeah, I went to school and um, I remember seeing all these kids who were different to me. When I say different, I mean at school in South Africa, you'd have boys had to have short hair and short nails and they can't color their hair and there's no piercings and all the works. And same with girls, only a minimum amount of piercings in the ear that look presentable and hair tied back nicely. And if it's a certain length, it you know, skirts have to be certain lengths as well. But that wasn't entirely the case. Some of the boys at the school had hair long like girls and was colored. And some girls had, you know, short hair and they, uh, they had piercings. And it was, it was quite strange for me. But that's, that's where it started for me. That's where my, my schooling in Australia started. That's where I did my VCE, my Victorian Certificate of Education. And they were ironically 2017 was one of the best years in my life that's where I learned to think for myself and I found my identity and I was I, I was watching tv shows like suits and guys like Harvey Specter he was my idol you know he always said the right thing they and suits had really good music that's where I learned to acquire tastes in music such as the Black Keys I I love the Black Keys and they had a couple of songs one was on suits but I, I went and bought their album later that year, El Camino, and it, it still, to this day, changed my life. And, and yeah, I just did stuff that I never thought I'd do once again. I, I got introduced into playing on the guitar. There was a music center at the school. And I was doing music for a little bit, and I learned to play. first song ever that I learned to play was Sunshine Feel Love by Cream. And I enjoyed it. I was like, I might actually be good at this. And I'm, I'm still slightly practicing to this day, trying to be good at it. But yeah, that's that's where I learned to think for myself. Um, and I recall I was quite lonely in 2017. So I had my friends in Wodonga across the water, across our little river. And I was living in Albury and I didn't have a license. And my dad and my brother were always working brother worked away a lot too so I was stuck at home a lot um, I was also working a lot at a restaurant on the weekend so I didn't really make a lot of time for friends unless they were at school or some school holidays here and there so I do recall in June July that year my sister Simone came to visit us and we showed her around and it was great, I had a friend, because we get along really good, because we lived with our mother, like I mentioned earlier. 
so yeah she she came and visited us and that was really good and um one of the main things i wanted to do in 2017 was i wanted to go back to south africa for a visit to say one last goodbye i guess and ironically to this day i haven't been back to south africa it's even before this pandemic and before COVID, I five gone and seen what I need to see and I haven't been back since. Um, and yeah, once I came back, I knew, okay, so Australia is, is my home now. This is, this is it for me. This is where I'm going to manifest myself and I'm going to make all my friends and I'm going to do my education here and, and eventually become a citizen which brings me to my second point and it was the applying part so we had to wait two years on our subclass 457 visa to prove that we paid taxes and to prove that we behaved we didn't have any felonies or any crimes charged to our names so after the two years we then had to do certain, I suppose you could say, we just had to be assessed in a way. One of the things that we had to do was an IELTS test. Now basically an IELTS test breaks down certain criteria to show how competent you are in speaking English. For those who don't have English as their first language, that is. So it basically looks at your reading, your writing, your listening, and speaking. So I recall me, my dad, and my brother, we had to drive up to a town here nearby called Wagga, where my friend Kay lives. And we had to take a day off Uh, my dad's company who he was with at the time who sponsored his visa or our visas i should say sponsored the day they sponsored these tests we had to take and um, they were quite costly i forget how much they are now but um it was probably a thousand dollars for the three of us at the time back in early 2018 so we drove down and um yeah look I was still in school, so to me, it was just another day at the office. I just had to take a weekend off work for my dad and my brother who'd been out of school for some time now. It's probably a different game altogether. Now, with these sections, each section, you'd need six out of ten to pass. So, we were we were quite nervous about it because some of the, I suppose, some of the content was overwhelming and it did seem like a long process, so if we did have to to do it again, we'd have to pay the, let's say, $350 per person out of our own pockets this time. So the pressure was slightly on. I recall one of the sections which was writing, as I mentioned, you need six out of 10. I recall my dad, uh, we were, we, our topic that we had to write about was uh, sport. And my dad, he, uh, he wrote that the importance of, about the importance of exercise. And he said that, um, exercising is a feeling I get sometimes. So I just go lie down until the feeling goes away. (laughs) That is no jokes what he said. And the minute we heard that, we thought, oh my goodness, did you, did you use the correct grammar? Did you use the correct punctuation? Are you, oh my goodness. And long story short, he got six out of 10 for that. He made it, he skimmed past, thankfully. Um, one of the sections my brother actually did the best in was uh, speaking. He's a people person, apparently, so he spoke. I recall in my speaking section, which I did brilliantly in as well, I had to talk about some random topic. One topic was how I think um, seasons affect employability or job opportunities. And I, I don't know what to say. I said, yeah, look, we have snowy mountains if there's no snow there's no skiers there's no ski instructors so there you go um i forget what else i said but it felt like an interview and i was spitballing just to make myself look as good as i can long story short we passed the ielts you know even if it was by a mile or an inch we passed um so that was done and then 
next up we had to do some police checks this this was months later as well so we had to go and find a police station that still did paper prints because uh, South Africa still uses a lot of paper so they needed us to have our prints on a solid piece of paper and the only police station we could find was in a town nearby called Mawela. It was quite a a small police station. I think there was only one person working that day to put into perspective. And and we went and we did our fingerprints. And lucky for us, we were in contact with a police officer in South Africa who would personally see to our documents. And we also couriered our documents with a private freight like DHL because if we were to use post, which then went to the South African National Post, we would almost certainly have our paper lost in transmission. They, um, to, to, to put into perspective, South Africa in 2016 trialed to have parents enroll their kids into schools online, and the system actually crashed. And the uh, majority of the other infrastructures consist of paperwork, so your public services, like you'd have your service New South Wales, or in this case it'd be public affairs. That's all paperwork, it's long queues. It's it's the classic it's the classic American motoring department where it's just lines and nothing's moving and everyone's not really in the mood to be there, employees and customers. So we saw to it that it was handled privately. And yeah, we, we took our fingerprints and it was it was literally you know, 30 fingers and the, the officer did it finger by finger by finger because that, I imagine, is something they have done in the past when paper fingerprints were uh, still a thing when you had to put ink on paper and that was still a relevant thing. I even recall the officer, by mistake or unaware of it, actually, um, instead of putting my pinky on my right hand on the... Uh, piece of paper she used my ring finger on my right hand so I had essentially a duplicate fingerprint and um, before we even because we had to pay for this as well before we pay them I said wait a minute now I I think I don't feel comfortable with this because if my application gets rejected which takes months to process then I'm in warm water so I'd feel more comfortable if we took another 20 minutes just to redo the process and go from there because I want us all to be on the same page with this and yeah I around about that time my sister decided that she wanted to live with us in Australia now I can't quite remember the process of how we did that but to put it quite straightforward um, we put her on a tourist visa which is only maybe a, a month 30 days I'm thinking and around about that time, it was my stepmother's 50th birthday. So we went to Bali in Indonesia for her 50th birthday. This was around June, July or September in 2018. And long story short, we set it up so that when she re-entered Australia, then she would be put onto our, at the time, subclass 457 visas. We were still on subclass 457 visas at this stage. So that... In a, in, in a matter of weeks, got handled and we went to Bali and next thing you know, we come back into the country and um, there was an issue at the airport with her visa to come back into Australia. So my dad explained to the gentleman that, you know, you know bless, bless him, he, he probably didn't realize what it sounded like, but he did say that. Oh no, we, we had to get her a visa quickly. And I said, oh dad, you know, it, it sounds like it's <laughs> it's not legitimate. Um, but it wasn't a big deal. She came back into the country and yeah, she uh, got into the subclass 457 with us. Now, if we fast forward to around May 2019, we got approved for our subclass 186 visas, our permanent residency visas. So me... My brother, my dad, and my sister. My sister didn't even have to do any of the tests. She didn't have to do her fingerprints. She came in at just the right time, I imagine. And she was also under 18. So that might have been in her favor as well, because it does matter if you're under 18. Which is why my dad urged me to 
consider coming to Australia before I turned 18 because it is, in fact, an easier process. Now, it's 2019 and we've just become permanent residents and we couldn't apply to be citizens until we have been in the country for four years. So four years for my dad and my brother would be January 2020. Four years for me would obviously then be the January 2021. And then for my sister, it would be 2022, June, July, around that era. So no matter what it is, you can't apply to be a citizen until you've been at least four years minimum in the country. So that means I had a lot of time to work and save up for uni because, which brings me to my waiting point. So my university or university in Australia, I imagine, you can apply for a government student loan, which is called a hex debt. So basically a hex debt, they cover your course and to memory 55 or sixty thousand dollars a year of a salary is when you start paying it back so once you make that criteria you start paying it back in payments in lump sum payments or whatever your arrangement is with the ato or whoever approves it um and yeah i i couldn't have a hex i i just remember that i had to work and put money away to be able to pay for my unique cash i had to pay my first year cost me ten thousand dollars. I paid that out of my pocket. You know, I finished my second year this year. It cost me fourteen thousand dollars cash. You know, there's no if or but about it. I'm on what's called a Commonwealth supported place, which doesn't really support anything except the ability to be to to, to go study. So I, I I had to pay it, and I must say there is ironically there is a degree of discrimination I felt in the process of becoming a permanent resident because before you become a permanent resident you can't vote you actually you can't even vote till you're a citizen but you can't get Centrelink or Medicare so Centrelink is the equivalent to in South Africa they've called SASA it's a government scheme where if you're unemployed or disabled or anything in that line you'd have some guaranteed payments for whatever your needs are Actually, in Australia, for this disabled individuals, you have the NDIS, the National Disability Scheme. So, I yeah, we couldn't get Medicare or Centrelink, and Medicare is important because I remember in Year Twelve, I went to see um, a psychologist, uh, the well-being team at school, and um, we were on private health, we weren't on Medicare, but. No matter where you go, they'd ask you for a Medicare card. And they asked me if I had a Medicare card. And I got really worried. I said, no, I don't. Uh, is that going to be a problem? They go, no, no, we just need it for your details. We don't, you know, we're not, it's free. We're not going to charge you anything. And, um, and yeah, with, even with the, the hex debt, I, I felt that has been a huge challenge for me having to work to be able to pay for my university. I, I took a gap year. I had lots of time at first, but... You know, it's also made me appreciate my studying so much more because, you know, I'm paying for it. I I can feel the burn of this. It has to work or I need to be sure of what I want to do. A lot of people in Australia don't know what they want to study. The ones I've met anyways, I can't speak for the entire population. They don't know what they want to study or want to be, but they just go for it anyways. They do it for a year or two, then they drop out or then they defer and never go back to studying and they've got this hex debt of whatever my I said 14,000 for my course so let's say they studied my course of accounting they'd have $14,000 racked up and they have to pay in some breakdown of payments once they make 55 to 60 thousand dollars a year Um, I even remember with our with our tax that we paid we had a Medicare levy taken out of our, our tax when we got paid before we were permanent residents. Now, we weren't eligible for Medicare. So they they essentially took money that they shouldn't have taken, and I imagine it wasn't just us. And the only reason we picked up on it was because our accountant mentioned it to us. So our accountant recommended that we, we lodge some rebate scheme with Medicare in South Australia. Now, the problem was you have two years to lodge your 
your form and um, after that if it if you exceed two years after you lodge your form then your 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 lodgement essentially expires you can't see that money ever ever again so we did that and there was uh, there were multiple occasions where first of all this paperwork took months and months just to get back to us um, and when it did get back to us they had certain information missing or certain information on the forms were incorrect and after a couple of attempts i remember my dad got so frustrated that he said you know <laughs> never again don't worry about it i'm not going to do it it's not going to happen <laughs> so yeah we um i, I didn't it wasn't a lot of money for me anyways it's about 500 dollars they owed me in levy whereas for my dad and my brother who've been working for longer than me before they became permanent residents they they had i don't know maybe over a thousand close to two thousand that the government owed them so it, it is interesting when you when you look at those things and you just see how you're treated differently. I, I mean, I had to go to school in Victoria because I couldn't go to school in New South Wales purely based on my nationality. Not that they have anything against Australians. Or Australians have anything against South Africans, but it's the, it's the fact that I wasn't an Australian to begin with, which I find is unfair. Um, I even recall at times how a gentleman when I was working in construction for this company called Hansen Heidelberg Cement Group this gentleman who I won't mention um, said that everyone like me or anyone who's not Australian is an import he had the audacity to say nothing against you that's just how I look at it and not to rant but these things make me feel like that if they went to South Africa and they were, you know, in my case, and they couldn't speak Afrikaans or they were made fun of for having a, an English accent that was different to everyone else's and they couldn't vote and they couldn't do certain things. I think if more people were exposed to that, they'd really understand how foreigners like myself would feel and respond to those things. So, and I, I had a thick skin. I never let it get to me. In, in school, I was never bullied. I, I actually... Yeah, I actually self-deprecated at times because we were comfortable. Like we, we'd make calculated jokes and inside jokes about each other, not just me as an Australian, but them as Australians as well. Because we're, we're, no one's perfect in this world, and Australia certainly doesn't have a perfect history, although it does have an amazing history, as does South Africa. So that was the waiting. We did all our paperwork and we just had to behave for two more years and or I had to behave for two more years. My my dad and my brother probably had six more months that they had to wait before they can lodge any paperwork. And then yeah, came January two thousand and twenty one, last year January, I um I lodged my my citizenship application. I um I recall having to scrap together literally every piece of of information about myself that I could find. I had to say where I lived in Australia. I had to say who my brother and sister, who they are, and I had to give their passport numbers. I had to say who my mother was. I had to give her birth certificate. I had to give my dad's. I had to, all the addresses, like I said, the bonds, the, the lease agreements. It was a massive deal. And despite having put my documentation, driver's licenses, passports, photo IDs, you name it. After putting all that in, they still said I needed someone to vouch for my identity. I had to take a passport photo and have someone essentially fill out a document, a separate document actually, that goes with your application, stating I am who I say I am, and then they have to sign the photograph as well and date the photograph. Now in my instance, I asked former mayor Kevin Mack, who was also our neighbor and one of our really good friends, I asked him to do it because not anyone can sign these papers as well. They, they, they have to meet certain criteria. So they have to be a justice of the peace. They have to be a member of parliament. They have to be a registered doctor or a registered nurse, someone in a profession, so to speak. So I had Kevin Mack sign mine just because he was the closest to access. Um, I suppose looking back at it now, I could have asked a justice of peace at the local library on a Saturday morning 
to do the same thing and I was given oath. But yeah, so that, that went in the in the application and I ended up paying $180, $200 for the application to be lodged and um, that was that was sent. I did not hear anything from the Department of Immigration until most likely July that that same year, July 2021, telling me I have a citizenship test. I have a citizenship test that was scheduled mid-August, just after my birthday, actually. So I made the phone call because that means I can get a hex. That means if I can get my citizenship approved quick enough, I can then have my next semester of uni paid for because I, I, I couldn't afford it. I was I was living paycheck to paycheck at that point because life was quite expensive. I was living at a home and some weeks, you know, better off than other weeks. It's just how it goes. My friend Katie he moved to Wagga, joined the army. And yeah, I was covering his half of the rent, his half of the groceries, the bills. So yeah, it, it was full on at times. So I was hoping that I could get my citizenship application sorted and get the ceremony done and hopefully when the dust settles, I'll be eligible for a hex debt, um, which which wasn't the case. Um, the pandemic, COVID, there's lockdowns in New South Wales and Sydney at the time. It had hundreds and hundreds of cases a day at one point. So, yeah, it got pushed back a month. So it got pushed back to September. Um, and at this point, I actually did end up getting a loan. I did um, go and... Which, which I think is a good thing in hindsight because having a bit of credit history would help future endeavors, I imagine. Um, so I was preparing for September now. And then, you know, come start of September, New South Wales was still in lockdown. So they pushed it back to October. So I said to my dad, okay, great. It'll be... Because his... By that point, my dad's citizenship ceremony was booked in for October. So I thought, great, we can have it at the same time, and the mayor at the time, Kevin Mack, would probably sign both our documents. That would be amazing. Um, and then, surprise, surprise, it got pushed back another month. Mine got pushed back until November, whereas my dad at this stage had already gotten his. I, I don't recall what the reason was for his not being pushed back, but mine was pushed back another month. So this is three months now that I'm behind. So I went for my citizenship test in uh, November and the citizenship test I should actually in this episode I should include a link to a practice citizenship test and perhaps the podcast channel just for anyone who wants to attempt it or listen to whatever is in the handbook I, I know a few Australians I had do the practice test that that absolutely failed that you know wouldn't even be allowed into Australia because of their lack of understanding of Australia but yeah, to, to study for the citizenship test, it's not full on. It, it is it is quite black and white. I, I had legal studies in school as well, so I did understand some of the, the rules of parliament and how, how there was judicial powers and legislative powers. So I did understand some of that, which were a couple of core questions, but not the entire test. A lot of it asked about what Anzac Day represented or what happened on Anzac Day, what a referendum is. It asked... Some of it asked even how um, you know how laws are passed or bills get passed. Um, I remember somewhere in the in the podcast I was listening to for the, the test they mentioned how the golden wattle is the the national flower of Australia and um, and I thought that was that was interesting. It explains the the gold and the and the green um, and all the other stuff. I it was common sense already. It also de- delved into Aboriginal background, Aboriginal lands, and the breakup of the states and the territories. Now, the Commonwealth Star represents these states and territories, each point in the Commonwealth Star being. Um, so that was, it was, I, I didn't feel intimidated by the citizenship test itself. I knew if I failed the citizenship test at the end of my application, the last step I needed to take, I I knew that you know I probably have to go and do it again, which which I probably I wasn't looking forward to because because I'd like to get it done, I'd like to be a citizen, so my next year at university would be covered. 
So, yeah, I did my test. I got 20 out of 20. I got full marks. And a week later, they told me my application had been approved and that I should hang tight. They'll send me a date to, for my, for my um, ceremony. And um, lo and behold, I had my ceremony on Australia Day. So, yeah, Australia Day this year came around. And I remember sending, a, a, I had to send an email, first of all, to say who was coming. Um, and then I had to obviously ask a lot of people if they wanted to come. And all these people I've met in my time in Australia, and I've accumulated all these friends, they were suddenly stoked for me. Everyone was celebrating me, which I'm not used to. I'm quite shy and humble about these things. So... Yeah, I, I had a whole back row of people in Norrill Park, one of the parks here in our town by the, the Murray River, lined up for me. And it was breathtaking to realize I'd, I'd walked this path with them. I'd walked this journey with them in Australia, in Albury and Wodonga. So they were there. I was sitting in the front and the new mayor at the time, Kylie King, got up and she obviously acknowledged the elders past and present and all the new citizens of Australia like myself um, I had to get up from my seat when I called my name I got given a branch of the gum tree by an Aboriginal representative and I had to get up on the podium and take a photo of Kylie King who noted that I made quite the impression on the people who were cheering for me which yeah, which meant a lot. It meant a lot that they were cheering for me. And yeah, I I just recall being pulled aside by a news presenter and they did a quick interview with me and a few others. They were there. There were some other immigrants from um, Bhutan, Thailand, Pakistan, a lady from England who's been here for 32 years and finally did it. So it was, it was a good day for all of us. I remember even today I went and bought the paper to put aside and keep because I, I've never been in the paper. I, I made the news that night. I was never in the news before. I didn't do anything that saved lives or anything of too much significance considering all the brilliance in the world. But it meant a lot to me. They were, they were celebrating us. I was being celebrated for becoming part of Australia, for accepting Australia. And I had give, I'd been given the option to pledge in front of people, in front of the country, or to pledge in front of God. And I consider myself to be religious, I'm a Christian. So I pledged before God. And that meant a lot to me too, because in my opinion, I wouldn't be here or anywhere in my life if it wasn't for God. Which is something I don't always express to people, because I have met quite a few people who raise their eyebrows when you mention any kind of religion, which I've learned over the years to suppress, to not force upon them as they don't force their views upon me. It's a mutual respect. So I pledged before God and that was it. You know, the, um, the coin dropped and something I thought about once, five years ago and completely forgot about became a reality within minutes it was, it was breathtaking. So for anyone who's listening to this or watching the episode on YouTube, the only thing I can really say to yourselves is to, to be patient, to, to try new things, to take the experience as it comes, to keep your closest friends and if, you have, if you're fortunate to have family with you here, keep them by your side and, and go, through, go through the hardships and go through the wins together. That's what we did. We had lots of wins and losses along the way, lots of frustrations, but we made it work as we had each other no matter how much we fought. And that's, that's all it is at the end of the day. And travel, it's such a beautiful country. You want to see what you're getting yourself into. Meet people, see things drink a little, gamble a little. I, I saw this really cool thing where someone, it's not probably not a true story, someone had died and they, uh, the insurance company said that um, because he had 
never gambled, never smoked, never kissed a woman, never sped, never did anything exciting because he never lived, they argued, he never died. So, yeah, think about that. Don't, don't obviously go out of your mind. But experience the country you're in, if it's Australia like me or whatever country, for what it is. See things, meet people, and at the end of the day, everything will be fine. And if nothing's fine, then it's not the end of the day. Thank you for listening to this episode. Whoever heard this, whoever felt these words, I'm glad to have made a difference. And for those who haven't found this yet, I hope you do find this. And I hope it gets you through whatever it gets you through. The things I say today might not be entirely accurate when you hear it, as they do change like night and day. But just know that this is my story. This is how it happened. Thank you very much. I'm Alan Fisher. Thank you for listening.